Darkcast Network. Indie pods with a dark side. Mountain Murders is an Appalachian true crime podcast. Some content may not be suitable for all listeners. Listener discretion is advised. We say fuck a lot. Hey y'all, welcome back to Mountain Murders. I'm Heather. And I'm Dylan. Hey Dylan. Oh man. We are approaching Halloween. Are you excited? I am very excited. Uh, It's been a pretty good spooky month so far and uh, I think it's going to finish strong. Yeah, we had a bit of a... I don't know, a get together with some friends last night or costumes. Yeah, I, I wonder if that's what happens when you get older and maybe a little boring, if you will, because uh, you and you and your wife and one other couple, you guys dress up and then just eat dinner together at your house. Yes. Just the four of you. And then you take your costume off before the night ends because, because you're... everyone is uncomfortable. <laughs> because we ate so many. And we all want to put on <laughs> stretchy pants yes. to make room for the food. Yes. Hey, whatever may, you know, whatever type of evening you enjoy, I had fun and I thought it was great. Didn't have to go out and fight any kind of crowds or anything like that. I'm looking forward to seeing costume photos. I've, I've made the rounds on social media. I've got to see a few creative costumes, but I would like to see more costumes. So if you have a really cool costume, send us a pic. Podcast at gmail.com. We would love to see it. Absolutely. Dylan, we have an interesting case. Would you like to get started? Yeah, we have to dive straight in. We have no time to waste. Frankfurt is a northeastern Philadelphia neighborhood located about six miles from the city center. Established by Quakers in 1682, Frankfurt was mostly inhabited by Native Americans and the Dutch. Later, the neighborhood became home to many Swedes and Finns. An early suburb of Philadelphia, Frankfurt was named after the Frankfurt Company. A grist mill was established in the 1660s, setting the stage for the area to become a hub of manufacturing. By the American Revolution, Frankfurt became known for its gunpowder mill. In 1922, the L, or elevated train, arrived bringing more jobs and access. Frankfurt was absorbed by the city of Philadelphia, Eventually, and by World War II, Frankfurt's arsenal rivaled the Philadelphia Navy Yard, employing 22,000 workers. Wow. It was also a center for textile manufacturing. Frankfurt became a bustling place for shopping. Some traveling circuses established winter headquarters in that area. During prosperous times, the neighborhood offered a symphony orchestra and was also the birthplace of the Philadelphia Eagles football team. Go Eagles! The white flight of the 1950s saw people leaving the city for the suburbs. And by 1980, the 13-block strip surrounding Frankfurt Avenue devolved into a crime-ridden slum frequented by sex workers and drug addicts. Now, Dylan, this is a tale we have heard many times before. Uh, uh, When it comes to some of these true crime cases, we hear these stories about maybe a suburban neighborhood or an area that's become populated, there's manufacturing, there's good jobs, and then those industries go away, people move to the suburbs, and the area just becomes like a broken down, a a bit of a ghetto, if you will. Yeah, early on, um, these uh, bustling little areas were always clumped around the railroads, typically, because of, like you said, access, and uh, that's where your little boom towns would start. And then, you know, as uh, er, more and more people got a car and then the roads became better and the inter- interstates, you know, got developed, uh, it gave you the ability to live, you know, 50, 60 miles outside of town. And, uh, you know, I do take one exception uh, to what you said. It's the white flight. I would call it the affluent flight. 
because if you don't have, uh, you know, resources and money, then you're not going to be able to move out of the city and, you know, commute back and well, forth. Well, I think statistically, Dylan, they call it the white flight because it was primarily Caucasian people who had the means to do that. Affluent Caucasian people. <laughs> I guess that's a tit for tat. Famously, Sylvester Stallone chose the rundown area as a filming location for his 1976 Academy Award winning film, Rocky. As Dwayne Swarzynski wrote for the Philadelphia City Paper, the neighborhood had once been a thriving section of town known for its music scene and shops. That is, until crack cocaine, economic crisis, and poorly planned city engineering took its toll on the district, turning it into a ghetto. Yeah, well, the more and more people move out, you lose your tax base, and it's really hard for these areas to bounce back without... Um, fresh new industries and a lot of money pouring back into the area at the time a popular bar goldies was the hangout of marginalized women nobodies female bar flies who if they weren't active sex workers certainly lived a similar lifestyle as swizzer swizz <laughs> sipping on some scissor as this writer described it uh, as i just mentioned before um, I had a better chance at saying his name a few minutes ago. Apparently now I can't do it. <laughs> the scene was ripe for a serial killer to prey upon these women. The nobodies, as they were called. The Frankfurt Slasher first came to public attention on August 26th of 1985. Around 8.30 a.m. on that morning, transit workers located the body of a woman lying between the rows of railroad tracks ties at the septa train yard at Penn and bridge streets at the time her identity was unclear the woman was found nude from the waist down and posed in a sexually provocative provocative position with her legs spread so this is definitely um, done to humiliate this woman yeah to bring always, shame upon her yes definitely and and I was, I'm sure it shocked anyone who would come upon the scene. Her blouse was pulled up to expose her breasts. The victim had multiple stab wounds to the head and chest, and there was a deep laceration to her abdomen. It was deep enough to expose her internal organs. Oh, my gosh. And I, I think it, it would also represent a certain level of comfort for the killer to take the time after he's done this to the poor victim to uh, pose their body, which I... I've always found that rather strange. It's a fair point. The the posing of b the body, and some killers choose to do that. Yeah, it's so intentional. Yeah, and yeah. and degrading. Right. It's all. It's, it's like even in death, you are degrading this person. Yes, agreed. She also had a wound on her right arm. Some reports suggest the victim was stabbed forty-seven times, while another account stated nineteen. But either way, this was a very violent like berserker-style attack. An autopsy would reveal the woman had been sexually assaulted. It was a brutal slaying. The woman was later identified as 52-year-old Helen Patent of Parkland, Pennsylvania. The Bucks County resident was divorced but still shared a home with her former husband, 75-year-old Kermit Patent. According to Kermit, the pair lived separate lives, so it was not uncommon for them to have no contact. According to Kermit, Helen was last seen on August 19th. Helen was known to frequent many of the bars along Frankfurt Avenue. Police canvassed the area. With little to go on and no obvious motive, police theorized that Helen had met a stranger at one of the bars and ended up dead. Unfortunately, incidents of random violence are fairly common in large cities. Yeah, and I think... Um it's always so sad, and it's just a story that we hear over and over. These nobodies, as you referred to them, these throwaway people, and they're always preyed upon, and, and it seems like it's often in an area like this, it's, it's kind of desolate, uh, industrial, you know, a train yard or, you know, some factory, you know, abandoned factories, if you will. And, and that is just the perfect place for a predator to prey. And then now you have these people who are willing – to get into strangers cars you know go with people they don't know and it's just a perfect perfect recipe for this type of killing on january 3rd of 1986 law enforcement was called to the scene of another homicide just 10 miles from where helen Patton's body had been found 
68-year-old Anna Carroll was killed in her apartment located um, on the 1400 block of Rittner Street. She was found lying on the bedroom floor with six deep knife wounds to her back. She had also been brutally dissected from her breastbone down to the groin, as if the assailant had tried to gut her. Near the body, law enforcement found a bloody kitchen knife, the murder weapon embedded in one of the wounds. Neighbors had reported her absence to the landlord, who had gone to check on her. There was no sign of forced entry, and the apartment had not been ransacked. Neighbors told the Philadelphia Inquirer that Carol had resided alone at the three-story brick apartment building for several years. Though other residents had tried to become acquaint acquainted with Carol, she lived a solitary life. One neighbor told the newspaper, quote, You tried to be friendly, but she wouldn't let you. She ignored you, really. Others speculated the increased drug activity in the area had brought more crime and suggested that perhaps, you know, this was just like some random, like, drug-addled murder. Right. Just uh, some... The typical random violence you see around these uh, rundown neighborhoods. But when law enforcement officials began investigating, they learned Carol, like Patton, had been a regular at several bars along Frankfurt Avenue. However, police didn't initially investigate the murders as related incidents. Now, descriptions of some of these uh, murders is it puts al almost puts me in the mind of like a sloppy Jack the Ripper. That's you know exactly what I, mean? what I thought. Is we have a modern day Jack the Ripper, right? Maybe a little less precise. You know, Jack the Ripper was known for his precision, almost surgical-like precision. But uh, at the same time, it just seems to be a lot of rage. And, and like you said, almost a berserker mode for this killer. He's just, I mean, it's almost like he loses himself. Nearly a year passed with little progress made in either case. It wasn't until Christmas Day of 1986 when a resident of the 4700 block of Richmond Street noticed 64-year-old Susan Olzeff's front door open. Checking it out, the neighbor found the woman lying dead on her living room floor. She had six knife wounds in her back. There were no signs of forced entry uh, once again. Susan Olzeff lived alone. Her apartment was located just three miles from the first murder scene where Helen Patton had been discarded. Upon further inquiry, police learned that Olzeff had a similar connection to the other victims. She had also been a regular bar patron in the Frankfurt area. In fact, all three women had been regulars at the Golden Bar, which was known locally as Goldie's. It was located on the 5200 block of Frankfurt Avenue near the elevated train terminal. So you have three women, three separate women, who are heavy drinkers no, uh, and frequent these bars. Okay. Uh, I think I'm missing. They're not sex workers. No, these they're are just bar flies, these are just if you will. Bar flies. Okay, I apologize earlier when I was talking about they would go with the, you know strangers and stuff like that. But you know, you have someone who's a, uh, you know, I think we've all done a little bit in our lives. You go drink at your local joint and maybe hook up with somebody, or think you're going to hook up with someone, or maybe they offer to, hey, let's go down by the train yard and smoke a joint or something to that effect, and then next thing you know. Boom, there's a monster attacking you. Police decided to focus their attention on Goldie's and the Frankfurt Avenue area. It was easier said than done. The Frankfurt area attracted a number of commuters from all over the city, with many traveling on the L to the late night bars and taverns along Frankfurt. It would be easy for a murderer to ride in, commit a crime, then disappear into the crowds. Sergeant John McCafferty, who was performing surveillance on the area, said, quote, you'd be surprised at how many people pass through there in an hour. That would be much more difficult to surveil and try to keep track of when you have uh, this uh, public transportation like a train that goes out to the suburbs available very nearby. I mean, it'd be almost impossible without a lot of resources and, you know, a whole lot of personnel to cover all, the, you know, all the exits, if you will. No, you're, you're absolutely correct, Dylan. And police were still not certain that the three murders were connected or the work of a serial killer. And we've seen this time and time again. Law enforcement is very slow to admit, hey, we've likely got a serial killer on our hands. Because most departments don't have the resources to handle a serial killer. 
no one wants that to be the case. No, and uh, and I, I think that's smart to a certain degree. I mean, we've had some cases where it was, I mean, my God, it was obvious. And it's almost laughable that the authorities were not coming forward. Because I think at a certain point, you need to warn the public. And you can also put out the call for them to have due diligence, you know, be extra nosy or attentive of all the people around them. And once you put that out, you know, someone may see someone just come around a corner or loitering in a, a strange place. Normal circumstances are not going to remember that, but if they're on high alert and they've seen these types of news stories going around, they may not might be something they pay attention to. You might get a good break. Jean Durkin, 28, was a homeless woman who was often seen loitering in the doorway of an abandoned bakery two buildings away from Goldie's Bar. Jeannie, as she was known to family and friends, um, had lived a fairly charmed middle-class lifestyle growing up. She was a known animal lover who had cared for turtles, cats, dogs, rabbits, frogs, hamsters. Her family couldn't explain how their once bright, blue-eyed, blonde daughter had fallen into a bad crowd. It happens. I mean, you know, some... Sometimes parents or family, they just can't, they don't understand or they don't want to blame themselves. Sometimes people just get in with the wrong people and they like certain activities and, you know, birds of a feather. You're going to do what your friends do, you know? She began abusing alcohol and drugs. Her family also said she had suffered from an undiagnosed mental illness. Her mother told the Philadelphia Inquirer, quote, We don't know where the drug damage stopped and the mental illness began. Durkin's family knew she was headed for a bad end. They just didn't know how bad. Durkin's body was found on January 8th of 1987, lying beneath a truck parked on Pratt Street behind a produce stand. Durkin, who had been separated from her husband for about 10 years, was a patient at the Philadelphia State Hospital, known as Byberry, for mental health issues. Her sister said Durkins chose to be homeless. Quote, she had no responsibility and people just accepted her as she was. She couldn't handle life. Durkin was found lying face down with a coat pulled over her head. Her underwear had been pulled down to the ankles and her pants were discarded nearby. An autopsy revealed she had not been sexually assaulted. The woman was stabbed 74 times in the head, chest, and back. My God. She was the 42nd homeless person to die in Philadelphia within a two-year period, raising alarms about the ever-growing population of unhoused in the city. Now, I don't know what the, you know, what they would consider a normal, more normal number on that statistic, but 42 in two years seems like a lot. Yeah, I don't think that's like a normal statistic, Dylan. Philadelphia was facing a serious crisis um, when it comes to the homeless at this time and they were also noticing um, that many of them were turning up dead not necessarily murder although there were several right crimes as I, I looked into the case there were quite a few homeless folks who had been murdered at this time but you've got drug you know drug addiction drug overdoses you have uh, just sort of I guess natural, causes and that kind of thing but that's a lot of people in a two-year period yeah i mean uh, Phil philadelphia is a uh, you know pretty far north in, in in our country obviously and cold so i'm sure you got some environmental issues uh, expo dying of exposure the cold and things like that durkin was found only a block away from where helen Patton had been left the attack had been so frenzied noted investigators that there was blood spatter against a fence and on the side of the truck near where she was found. Yes, it's literally like a frenzy. It was now clear that Philadelphia had another serial killer problem. The city had been thrust into the spotlight with the ar arrest of Gary Heidnick, and now, with increasing pressure from the public, authorities assembled a task force to look into the Frankfurt slayings. Now, we covered Gary Heidnick Gosh, that's been probably, what, about a year ago? Yeah. And he's a vicious, I mean, he was a vicious serial killer. Kept those women tied in his basement. Yeah, he was something else. Yeah. 
So you already have that uh, making national headlines. Now, he's the one that was uh, fairly intelligent and uh, was living off his investment choices and opportunities, things like that. I believe so, yeah, yes. And, uh, and was, he was kind of like a fake preacher. Yeah. Yeah, but he was vicious. Yes. I mean, hold them captive, you know, terrorize and torture them, you know, daily or whatever he wanted to do. Yes. Yeah. I mean, his home was described as a house of horrors. The task force began interviewing patrons and staff of the many bars along Frankfurt Avenue. There were lots of opinions and conjecture, but no solid leads. One thing did emerge. Those who knew the fourth victim, Jean Durkin, insisted that she would not have been an easy target. Jeannie had lived on the streets for about five years when she was found murdered. Many knew her to be streetwise and independent. In the past, there had been an incident involving Jeannie in which six officers attempted to subdue her unsuccessfully. Jeannie was tough and would have fought her attacker, according to friends. Well, yeah, it sounds like she could hold her own. Absolutely. Investigators suspected Jeannie likely knew her attacker. A suspect emerged when law enforcement learned that Durkin had a physical altercation with a woman named Michelle Denner over a blanket the night before. Law enforcement was able to clear Denner of any wrongdoing. Despite four bodies, police were still not sold on the idea that these four w women were victims of the same killer. And let's be honest, again, no law enforcement agency wants a serial killer on their hands. Right. And they still are dealing with a uh, random crime. You know, they're not, it sounds like they're not exactly alike as far as the, you know, obvious, obviously being posed. Some victims sound like they're posed more than, the, more than others. And uh, just the viciousness of the killing, it's not very methodical. So, you know, there's not a, a real obvious uh, signs of them being connected. Maybe. It could be anybody. Right. That's the other frightening part of this. Investigators have no motive. They have no suspects, no witnesses. They have nowhere to start, no thread to pull on. Exactly. So it's really like square one with very limited information to go on. Well, and you have these people that are, um, they're kind of hard to keep track of when you have people that are displaced or uh, homeless. And uh, it's very hard to get a timeline. And timelines are very important when to give you somewhere to start as far as now if someone goes to school, work, you know, they have a fairly rigid schedule. It's kind of, it's a lot easier to figure out when they fall off the radar, where they were going, what part of town they might have been in, or who they may have kind of come into contact with. But in these cases, you're getting a lot of vague descriptions you people i think i might have seen them last week you know so and so family members have been out of contact for some time in some cases years i mean it, it, it's almost impossible for even a really good investigator to get some kind of a lead going well and the first three victims were older women yeah they did not necessarily have close ties to family friends I mean, as Anna Carroll was described as she kept to herself and it was really hard to even be friendly with her. She did not want to associate. So these are people who are kind of isolated, even though they're living in a big city. They seem isolated. They seem lonely. Man, it would take people weeks to miss us. And that the bar is their primary means of socialization. I think our listeners would notice before the people we actually know in real life that were missing. It's true. <laughs> Extra huh. patrols were added to the Frankfurt area, squads with undercover officers, and they had this task force of homicide investigators that combed the neighborhood. Yet, given the large number of shoppers, commuters, sex workers, and homeless frequenting the area, it was pretty hard to keep track and to keep up with what was happening in Frankfurt. So far, police knew the victims were hard-drinking women who frequented Goldie's, the Happy Tap, and the Jolly Post Tavern. <laughs> these place, these bars have great names. The Happy Tap? The bars seem to be the common denominator connecting the victims. Police questioned men trolling the area for sex workers, 
careful attention was paid to single women stumbling out of the bars alone, as well as women who departed with men. On November 11th of 1988, the Frankfurt Slasher, as he was now being called by law enforcement, found his next victim. 66-year-old Margaret Vaughn was found in the foyer of an apartment building. Vaughn had resided in that building until the day before when she had been evicted for unpaid rent. The woman had taken to the Frankfurt bars to drink away the sorrows of now being without an apartment. Vaughn was stabbed 29 times. Vaughn's murder was different in that it gave police something to go on. On the night of her murder, Vaughn had been drinking at one of the local bars. Witnesses had seen her in the company of a Caucasian man who was described as having a round face and glasses and that he walked with a limp. A sketch artist was able to produce a likeness which was distributed around Philadelphia. However, it did not produce any leads. But at least we have an idea that she was seen with this man. Well, I mean, it's something. And what he looked like. And, and I think sketches sometimes can help it or sometimes they hurt. Well, I've seen those Richard Ramirez sketches. Yeah. None of them <laughs> look similar. Yeah. And they have him looking crazy. I've seen one of those sketches where Richard Ramirez is like an E.T. with a bad perm. Oh, my God. I know the one you're talking about. Yeah. I was like, when did this... Uh, this police sketch artist start working, you know, is it, what is this? A 10 year old is like in crayon and yeah, shit. Some of them are so bad. They're pretty that bad. You're like who, who hired this person to be a sketch <laughs> artist? I thought you had to have at least a little bit of talent. And they turn around. It's just a wiener dog. Like, is this, is this the man who accosted you? <laughs> that, that is the corn dog that accosted me. Yes. Then on January 19th of 1989, the Frankfurt slasher struck again. 30-year-old Teresa Sciortino was found in her apartment on Erot Street. She had been drinking Budweiser at the Jolly Post Tavern for most of the day. Debbie, the bartender, told detectives she had left around 6.30 p.m., meaning um, Teresa had left around 6.30 p.m., after unsuccessfully picking up a man. She was on the prowl. Well, Debbie said that Teresa often came in. And was typically looking for a man. And when she didn't find one, she would leave uh, discouraged. Looking for love in all the wrong places. So this is what Debbie has seen on this particular evening. Like Durkin, Sciortino had been a former mental patient at Eastern Pennsylvania Psychiatric Institute and at Friends Hospital. She lived in a studio apartment one block from the commercial strip of Frankfurt Avenue. When her body was discovered propped up against the door by Superintendent Rocky Wardell, he reported the finding to police. Can you imagine being a building superintendent and you're just kind of making your rounds and you find a body propped up against the door? No. Of their apartment? (laughs) Definitely not. Yeah, it's a lot. That would be a shocking discovery. Neighbors claimed to hear two loud thumps before Sciortino's body was found at 1 a.m. She had been stabbed a total of 25 times in the face, arms, and chest. Now this part is brutal. So you might want to skip ahead if, yeah. Well, I think if they're still with us, they might be able to handle it. But it it seems to be a, a repeat of stabbing someone in the face and head. Not that it's okay to stab them anywhere. It just seems... A bit odd to me. You know what I mean? She had been sexually assaulted with a three and a half foot long blood soaked piece of wood that they found kind of lying up against the kitchen sink. My God. There were clear signs of a struggle in the apartment. A blood stained knife was also found at the scene. Her killer left behind a bloody footprint. See, yet again, a. Uh, uh... Being molested with a foreign object is, uh, yet again, in my book, meant to degrade, meant to just, you know, utterly humiliate, humiliate, God forbid, if the poor victim's, you know, still alive when that was to happen. But uh, there seems to be a reoccurring theme in this killer. It's not, it's not, it's definitely, I think it's a classic 
whoever he hates in his life, be it his mother, the one that got away, an old girlfriend, he is definitely reliving that, it seems, every time he attacks one of his victims. I agree. This pure rage. And, and yeah. Blood was everywhere. Teresa had put up a fierce fight for her life. Witnesses described Teresa as lonely, often showing up at the bars where she would stare at men waiting for them to pick her up. One bar patron said the way Sciortino looked at men was, quote, weird and scary, adding, quote, I'd say she had some kind of problem. Would that, would that work for you just to go sit in a bar and stare at men until they picked you up? Well, no, I don't want to make eye contact with men in general, so that's probably not going to work for me. I could see you staring at people in a weird, scary way. I stare at them in a weird, scary way like, don't, don't approach me. Don't sit down, don't sit down. Oh, my God, he's trying to talk to me. Yeah, please don't. (laughs) Plus, I'm not going to go to a bar and try to pick up on somebody, okay? You would never do that? I mean, now, obviously, uh, you're with the love love of your life. Like, here I'm in the second half of my life, and ain't nobody got time for that shit. Ain't nobody got time for that. Ain't nobody got time for that. I'm telling you, what was it you said you saw the other day that, uh, did you ever, it was Gen, was it Gen X is uh, looking at the dating scene and feeling like we got one of the last choppers out of uh, Vietnam or out of uh, Saigon, like what the scene's become. I mean, it seems very odd nowadays. I was never the big dater or anything like that, but nowadays it just seems with all the apps and everything moves so fast and Everyone has a a, a small attention span, it seems. Um, I would not want to be out there on the dating scene. No, I am embracing papal core. Yeah. Okay, where I'm I'm curmudgeonly. Yeah. I am set in my ways. I don't want to be bothered. Um, So if things don't work out with us, I'm I'm just single. You're just going to be like one of those single cell amoebas. You're going to be asexual. I'm just going to be single. Okay. I'm going to have a Rufus. Oh, so me and my dog are just gonna chill. <laughs> Be like, I like you to meet my uh, my housemate here, and it's just Rufus with a little town. Yeah, this okay. is my husband. His name is Rufus. <laughs> okay. Yes, he's the perfect man. He's quiet. He likes to play sometimes. Sometimes, and he likes to sleep a lot. He likes, yeah. We go on walks. So there's that, right? And he does not talk back. No, he's and he's very comforting. Skiortino had recently worked. For only one day at the new Riviera restaurant and cocktail lounge before being fired. The hostess recalled she was, quote, a space cadet, saying the woman was, quote, out there among the stars. She wasn't on Earth with you. Okay. Again, it sounds like Teresa might have been um, a, a bit of an easy target then. Because she's... Maybe not quite uh, lucid or or wherever with her it. surroundings. Yeah. Okay. Not maybe not as vigilant as others. Okay. I mean, that could make sense. Ski of twi- uh, ski skiortino had also been an IV drug user. She had track marks along her arms, and investigators discovered needles among her personal items at the studio apartment. According to those who knew her, Schiatino often spoke of her 11-year-old daughter who resided with her grandparents in South Philadelphia. Teresa often talked about getting custody of her daughter as soon as she secured employment. At the time of her murder, she was attending a psychiatric outpatient treatment program. Witnesses later said she left the Jolly Post Tavern in the company of a middle-aged white man. So let's talk a little bit about Teresa. She had grown up in a large Italian family, and they were fairly staunch Catholics. She was the sixth of nine children. It's a big family. (laughs) Yeah. Her father was a mechanic, her mother a seamstress. Teresa had been married 12 years before she was murdered, and that marriage produced the one child, but it didn't seem like the marriage lasted that long. Teresa remained close with her daughter, visiting her often. One family member told the newspaper, quote, She wasn't a terrible person. She was just a mixed up person, a troubled person. She was trying to make the best of her life, always trying to bounce back. The relative also added, quote, I would describe her as a little bit pathetic, but not hopeless. It's a tragedy, really. Many of the bar's um, female patrons said they were petrified 
of what was happening along Frankfurt Avenue, but it didn't stop them from going out. <laughs> when they were interviewed by the newspaper, some described changing up their routines. They might take cabs home instead of walking. One of the women said, quote, I think this guy only goes for weak women who were alone and take him home. Oh, so she's doing a chin up, tits out, walking down the street, very confident, head on a swivel. I might even run in a zigzag par- pattern across the parking lot. Well, uh, and it sounds a bit victim blamey too. Like, well, it's these women's own. It's their own fault they got killed. Yeah, yeah, it truly does. But uh, maybe, maybe that's not what they meant. But uh, as a poor choice of words, at the very least. Lynn, a 25-year-old prostitute, told the Philadelphia Inquirer, quote, I'm not really worried about no killer. He only picks on people who are all messed up. It's do or die, me or you. I'm not afraid to kill nobody who wants to hurt me. She admitted to carrying a gun. And Lynn, of course, her last name was withheld, denied having sex um, for drugs, claiming that she only did sex work in order to eat. She said alcohol often numbed the pain of losing custody of her four children and that she drank to, quote, blot out the pain. How? Okay. Well, it just doesn't seem like very good, uh, a very good cycle she'd be in. Because every time you come to or sober up, then you think about the pain again. And you got to clean your act up if you want to get your kids back. Around 2 a.m. on the morning of April 29th, 1990, a patrolman working along Frankfurt Avenue discovered a nude female body in an alley behind Newman's Seafood Market. The victim's face and head had been severely beaten, and she was viciously stabbed 36 times in the neck, face, chest, and back. Her stomach had been ripped open, allowing her intestines to spill out on the pavement. God, this killer's treating these women uh, like just... Like you would do some uh, deer or something, your field dressing. Her left nipple had been severed. She had a number of defensive wounds on her hands and arms. This victim would later be identified as 46-year-old Carol Dowd. Dowd lived nearby. In the hours before her death, she was seen walking with an older white man. Her clothing was found near her body, and her open purse was in the alley, with its contents spilled partly onto the ground. Because nothing had been taken, robbery was ruled out as a motive. Police suspected it might be the same man. Other witnesses had described um, having been seen with Vaughn and Teresa Sciortino um, before their murders. As police questioned employees of the fish market, a new suspect emerged. Leonard Christopher was a black man. He admitted to police that he had known Margaret Vaughn, And they immediately became suspicious. Now, this is the thing about Leonard Christopher, Dylan. He does not match the description of this white man, older white man with a limp. The wiener dog with glasses. That multiple women have been reported um, in in the company of this man, right? So here we have a black man, but he admits he knows one of the victims, so automatically police are focusing on him. Well, I mean... Wouldn't be the first black man to, you know, get some unwanted attention in one of these situations. And then, you know, once they do admit to the public that, hey, there's, you know, you get the press or the cops start giving nicknames. You're hearing things like slasher thrown around. You instantly start getting public pressure to at least get some suspects or get get something that something something tangible you can report at a press conference to the public. And that but that's just ridiculous the little bit of info you do have to go on is the complete opposite description of this man an able-bodied black man and here you have a, a white man with a limp is what's been described by multiple multiple witnesses so it's just it's ridiculous now christopher was employed at this fish market and he was described as a fish cutter like that was his job oh was being a fish cutter okay interesting now Christopher said that he and his girlfriend had seen a stocky old white man lurking around the store the day of the murder. Unfortunately for Leonard Christopher, his girlfriend denied that claim. A prostitute who had initially lied finally admitted that she too had seen them together outside the bar. 
So she's saying that she sees Leonard Christopher with Carol Dowd outside of one of the bars. While another sex worker placed Leonard Christopher coming out of the alley behind the fish store, she said that when she saw him, he was sweating profusely and had a large knife stashed in his belt. So, okay. A search of Christopher's apartment turned up clothing with blood on it. However, he will later tell police that the reason he had blood on his clothing was because after the murder, like the following day, his boss sent him out to clean this up. Oh, like the scene the clean behind this, the store? Yes, to clean up this crime scene. Okay, and because also... Because he didn't want this in the alley behind the store. He could be leaving work where he, where he works at a, a fish place when he, when he's seen, you know, sweaty or with a, with a knife in his belt. So, I mean, that only goes so far. So Christopher called a friend at the fish market to tell them that police suspected him. That person who wished to remain anonymous told the local newspaper, the Philadelphia Inquirer, that their boss had told Christopher to clean up blood in the alley. So of course he had blood on his clothing. Others who worked with him vouched for his good character and just humanitarian nature, feeling that it was wrong to pin these murders on him. His landlord also confirmed these positive um, comments saying that he um, was a really great tenant and that the only complaint he had had with him is that on occasion he made too much noise. Oh, every now and again he gets a little loud. Although he was a black man and not the middle-aged white man seen with other victims, on May 5th, Leonard Christopher was arrested and arraigned on charges of robbery, abuse of a corpse, murder, and possession of an instrument of a crime. He was ordered um, to jail without bail. So, uh, was it doesn't sound like he has a lot of support anyway, a lot of support network. Um, so they just pulled the trigger. There doesn't seem to be a lot of evidence. I mean, it's circumstantial. Yeah, it, I don't know. I don't see the case against him, honestly. Two eyewitnesses. Two eyewitnesses and, and the information they're giving... It really doesn't, in my mind, prove anything. You've seen him leaving a place where he works at the fish market, where he cuts stuff up, likely, all the time, cleans big fish, and uh, he has a knife, and he's sweating. Wow, okay. And he, that was the and scene. And his alibi yeah. wasn't substantiated. Yeah. And, well, and that hurts a little bit. But And then, you know, he is, uh, one of the murder scenes was, you know, near his place of work, and that, that seems feasible that his uh, boss may send him out there to clean that mess up. You know what I mean? So that's not that's not the end of the world, in my opinion, if he has blood on him. Or just it could be a transfer from having just been around there or come through the area. Well, I mean, at this point, law enforcement officials are pretty desperate to make an arrest. And it really does seem like they snatched this guy up and are trying to pin at least one of the murders on him, right? Right. So on September 6th of 1990, while Leonard Christopher was incarcerated awaiting trial, the Frankfurt slasher returned. On Saturday afternoon, detectives were called to the scene of an apartment where they found Michelle Denner lying on her back. She'd been stabbed 23 times with wounds primarily on the chest and stomach. Now, if you recall, Dylan, this is the woman who had been in a physical altercation with the other victim, Jean Durkin. Right. That's what it, they yeah, had I been thought. arguing over a blanket. Yeah. Known as Crazy Michelle around the neighborhood. <laughs> That's a cute nickname. The woman frequented bars along Frankfurt Avenue and had previously been a suspect briefly in the Jean Durkin murder. Um, Danner was described in the Philadelphia Inquirer as a hard-drinking, paranoid loner. She was considered somewhat unconventional, sometimes barricading herself into her apartment. And other times, neighbors would describe her as erratically tossing things out the window, no matter who might be standing below. Well, that seems like a bad habit. Single and described as hard-edged, she frequented the same bars where the previous murder victims had often gone. 
a large blonde. She was often seen in sloppy sweatshirts and jeans and spent her time wandering from one bar to the next. Sometimes she sold soft pretzels on the street for income, but usually just spent her days drinking. It just seems like that would get old. Day after day, going drinking in, in some dive bar. That seems like that would get old for you. Yeah. Oh, come on. I know you. A few beers here and there is different than drinking every day. I mean, drinking at a bar all the time. That's only because I won't allow you to I would to rather sit this. at home and drink. See, exactly. I'm but just saying. Still... I wouldn't want to do it every day. I'm just I, saying. I don't believe it. I'm going to drink right now. I keep, uh-huh. <laughs> I keep thinking about the soft pretzels she was selling. I know. I, I have pre- questions. Were they homemade pretzels? I want a was pretzel Was she making now. these pretzels? Well, to be like uh, in and out of the pretzel trade, you know, no no real commitment there. It makes you wonder where she's acquiring uh, the wares of said trade. You know, those Auntie Annie's pretzels or whatever that mm-hmm. they have, the mall pretzels. Yeah. Them shits is good. They are good. The sour cream and onions are my jam. Maybe she's just selling pretzels whenever she finds like a big bag in the trash out behind another place. Maybe. Neighbors indicated to reporters that Crazy Michelle was not very friendly, and one person said that she did not often bathe. A day and a half before her death, Michelle had left the bar with a white man. Again, similar description. And Crazy Michelle and off her rocker Beth were known to get into it from time to time as well. Oh, yeah? Yep. There was no sign of forced entry and no weapon found at the crime scene. With the latest murder, residents called for the release of Leonard Christopher, yet he remained locked up until his trial began on November 29th of 1990. I mean, Dylan, you actually have the man in jail... While other murders are being committed. Well, I think that proves that he's not the murderer. I mean, I don't, I don't know what other evidence you need. There was no physical evidence linking Leonard Christopher to the crime scene, and no one could testify that they had seen him commit the murder. He had no history of violence, and there appeared to be no motive for Carol Dowd's killing. Several witnesses described him, again, as being very mild-mannered, likable, and that he just didn't seem to be the type. Police did find a blood-stained tissue with type O blood, which is the same as Carol Dowd's, in a driveway next to Christopher's apartment building, as if maybe he had discarded this napkin or tissue like he'd used it to wipe his hands right. and throw it on the ground. But again, we're going with blood type. Right. How many people are type O blood? He's a secretor. He's a non. I feel like I'm a non secretor. What would you think? I don't care. Okay. He suddenly remembered seeing a white man drop it there the night of the murder. Dropped it like it was hot. When police are asking about it. But the problem was that Leonard Christopher had already said he wasn't at home that night. So how could he see the man drop the net? Drop the. Okay. On December 12th, after hours of deliberation, the jury returned a verdict. Leonard Christopher was found guilty of murdering Carol Dowd, and he was given a life sentence. What? It is very likely that this poor man spent time in prison for murder he did not commit. This was a flimsy case, man. I mean, seriously, there there was no meat in this uh, evidence that was against him. Agreed. There you go, a couple of eyewitnesses, black man, accused of whatever, boom. It happens a lot, and those eyewitness testimonies, I mean, sometimes I feel like they should not even be included because they are so often wrong. Well, even if it's, um, you know, some people are like, oh, you know, they're just saying that because he's, even minus uh, some kind of ill intent or just, at, you know, lying or some racist motivation to lie, you know, against this black man. It's been proven that just the way the human brain works. And once people get caught up in an investigation and they want to help, they just want to help. You know, they want to be the one that breaks the case or, you know, gets a killer put behind bars. And you will embellish. Your brain will misremember. And, you know, it's a, I think they've even proven that if you don't quite remember, your brain will just fill in the facts just so you can, you know, get it all processed. So it's just very – so many reasons – Reasons that eyewitness testimony 
though it can lead you in a certain direction or something, I honestly wonder to what degree, unless you have direct knowledge about someone, I honestly wonder if it should even be allowed in court testimony in a trial. I mean, seriously. Well, I mean, I think that's why most prosecutors want to have some physical evidence tying the accused to the scene. Right. Like, if we don't have, uh, you know, forensics, DNA, that kind of thing, do we have a weapon? Do we have uh, their cell phone in that area? I mean, some sort of tangible evidence to go along with it. Did he secrete? Did he not secrete? I mean, these are things we need to know about the killer. Well, having investigated more than 50 men who were seen leaving the bars with women, police had two men under surveillance, and they had leads on a third. Yet with no clear pattern to the killings in terms of time frame or victim type, they were kind of blindly investigating. They found it surprising that in each and every case, no one had seen a man with blood on him in the streets. Yeah, because these are vicious attacks, and there's no way... The killer's not literally getting covered in blood in most of these instances. Well, again, all of the victims had been viciously stabbed. Their attacker must have had quite a lot of blood on him. They had a composite picture from witnesses, and while they had received many calls, no one had actually turned in a person who was like a viable suspect. Like, none of the tips matched the description (laughs) <laughs> Other than it's just like an older white man. Yeah. But not walking with a limp. Doesn't match the sketch. I love how many people just turn in like their ex and shit. Or their boyfriend that they hate when, whenever a situation like this happens. They're just like, oh yeah, I think he did. It because Will you come get him like right now? <laughs> like come get him. The best clue that investigators had was an identification of the manufacturer of the shoe that had left a bloody footprint at one of the murder scenes. They did find a man who had similar shoes that were the right size, who knew one of the victims, but he was ultimately not linked to the crime, and his name was not released. At least seven of the murders have not been solved. So if Leonard Christopher was not the Frankfurt slasher, then who was? And why did he suddenly stop killing? For now, it appears the serial killer got away with murder. Oh, my gosh. So they never found him. D. Hughes, a bartender at the Jolly Post Tavern, told the Philadelphia Inquirer, quote, I honestly believe it was someone who comes in here and got to know them, meaning the victims. I agree. I think it was certain. I think it was, uh, if not a local, someone who uh, comes to the area all the time, so they're comfortable. They commute in and out, or maybe they used to live in the city. Now they, you know, live out in the suburbs and commute for work or something like that. And I think they definitely knew the area. I don't think this was some random person in and out. Um, I think they were comfortable, and uh, I would not be one bit surprised if they did not take time to get to know each victim or know of them. Well, you know, a lot of people will point to the fact that a serial killer has like a cooling off period and that sometimes that intensifies over time. Yeah. Um, So for um, a serial killer to just stop kind of cold turkey, did he go to jail? Did he pass away? Mm -hmm. Or is he in, yeah. But then when you look at someone like BTK, I mean, he had... An extended cool off period, like what, fifteen years or more? Yeah, and yeah, I think that is an outlier for the most part. But we've seen other cases where the cooling off period varies. Sometimes it's you know uh, gets uh, closer together, and sometimes it you know further apart. It can be very confusing for investigators. Although Leonard Christopher is still in jail for the murder of Carol Dowd, many believe he was wrongfully convicted. And the Frankfurt slasher is still at large. In 1990, police claimed they were closing in on a prime suspect based off the composite sketches. Although they would not reveal his name, they said he had been posing as a counselor and had rented out part of a church for an office. Police believed he was using this guise to lure women away with him. However, as police were putting their case together after the murder of Michelle Denner, uh, Their uh, suspect, sorry, ended up moving to another state. It was then that the murder stopped, and two years later, police 
informed the public that this particular suspect had died. But we don't have a name of this person. But that might make sense for this person to be posing as a counselor of sorts and going to the bars and you're meeting these troubled women who are, you know, heavy drinkers, many of them like alcoholics, some of them with significant mental illness. And you're posing as a counselor. I can help you. It'd be a good their trust. Yeah, their trust. You, they almost automatically trust you. And another good reason for the killer to stop would be that they did indeed, rather publicly, I'm sure, convict someone of one of the murders. So if you're a, a cunning, smart killer, you stop right there, and then they think they have their man in jail, or you like go to another area and, and start up, but you just leave it alone there. That could have been what happened. So, today, the Frankfurt Slasher remains an unsolved case. I I must admit, I I don't recall ever having heard of the Frankfurt Slasher. And these crimes were brutal and uh, obviously connected. In my mind, they seem connected. And, uh, yeah, I think it was definitely a full-blown serial killer, and I, I guess we'll never know. Did he get away or, you know, did he die? Or was it the one man who was put in jail? For five years, he terrorized this northeastern Philly neighborhood. That's wild. That's a long time. That's a long time. And a total of eight victims. So sad. And the profile is very strange, too, because these women, you know, range in age from like 28 up to, you know, being 68, 69 years old. Right. And the MO seemed to vary as well, you know, going from very meticulously staged early on as far as the body and stuff goes um, to, you know, sometimes uh, penetration with a foreign object. Sometimes it seemed like a, a little messier, you know, and just all oh, it just, but the entire time brutal, brutal attacks, full of rage, almost a loss of control. It would seem during the murders. And I still, I agree. How does this person get around even in a desolate place where, you know, not everybody you know, in plays like this, people tend to mind their business, right? Because they see all kinds of things, and, and they know better than to mess with people or be in their business. Well, it's true, but seeing someone but walking covered around in blood, covered in blood at like 2 in the morning, yeah. leaving an apartment building, even uh, and you're in a big city, right? someone has to see you. Even in one of the, the toughest, worst areas, that's going to stand out. That's why when you look into Ripperology, you know, the Jack the Ripper case, there's been speculation that he was possibly a butcher. Okay. Because they did have these, like, meat packing houses and that kind right. of thing in that particular neighborhood of Whitechapel. And that would have explained how someone could walk around covered in blood and not turn heads. Well, yeah, if you have, if you're still in your butcher outfit or you're at Bloody Apron and people are used to seeing you in this state, yeah, you're not going to give it a second glance. We'll never know, unfortunately. Maybe we will. Maybe one day. Maybe one day. I would be curious if there is any uh, DNA or uh, forensic evidence that has been preserved all of these years that they could go back and test that would be amazing wouldn't that be nice it would be nice Uh, thank you for that story heather yeah it's really sad and the fact that this is not more well known um find that to be disturbing i also find it very disturbing that we have this uh, fella sitting in prison that um, there wasn't a whole lot of um, actual evidence to convict him. He was convicted on circumstantial evidence. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's uh, that's an, another very sad element to this story, I think. Absolutely. Dylan, I am looking forward to a listener story episode. We'll oh, be man. dropping that here in the next couple of days. I cannot wait. I absolutely love, love the listener story episodes. And I would just like to remind everybody, you know, aside from Mountain Murders, we also have a movie podcast, Cult of Sleaze. We will be dropping a brand new episode on Cult of Sleaze. And I have my 80s podcast called Dancing with Myself. So glad you brought that back. They're just little, you know, less than 10 minute episodes. I drop three times a week. So you get Monday, Wednesday, Friday. 
And it's just going to go over a little bit of history, pop culture, but it's fun. It never fails to bring me, take me back to the 80s of my mind and make me feel very nostalgic. And I want, multiple times, every episode, I'll be like, I remember that. I mean, just vividly. I can vividly picture exactly what you're talking about. So I love, love dancing with myself. And it's really great for just, you know, you, it's nice to have those little short pods that are not real deep and uh, involved and uh, serious and just something fun and kind of light to, you know, just get you through the uh, Well, yeah. I mean, you, I, I, you know, I talk about music and fashion. Uh, Toys, whatever. at the time, politics, give you a little biography about famous people. I kind of mix it up every episode. I love it. Yeah, it's fun. So check it out. And again, Cult of Sleaze, that's our movie podcast. We review horror films, B-movies. Oh, my gosh. Movies that are so bad, they're good. Definitely. Yeah. Okay. Also, if you would like to join us at patreon.com slash mountain murders podcast, that is a good place for you to support the show and get ad free episodes. I should also add that our top tier gets ad free um, bonuses of our other podcasts as well as mountain murders. Yes, and uh, not only that, you also get access to our Discord, our little Discord family over there, um, the intimate circle, if you will. And uh, yeah, we just can't, we would love for you to get, check all that out. Check all that extra content out. And if you have a listener story you would like featured on the show, you can always send us an email, mountainmurderspodcast at gmail.com. Dylan, I hope that uh, you have a great rest of your week i will i'm gonna put you to bed i know i'm tired okay i'm over here yawning it's past my bedtime all righty okay, then hey we'll be back here in a couple of days with a midweek bye y'all bye california has the largest population in the united states and the site of some of the most famous true crime cases in history but there's more than meets the eye to the crime in california join sean jessica and charles on the California True Crime Podcast as they cover crime both infamous and overlooked from around our state while looking at the deeper history that goes beyond beaches and movie stars.